If we follow the news closely, and too often today, especially we look at this geopolitical change, and too often we tend to focus on topics related to economy, international relationships. Well, in life, there's another type of relationship we also need to pay attention, which we call human relationship. Now, did you know that today, younger generations are finding more difficulties in locating ideal partners, and especially among the ones who are very successful? Take the United States of America, for example. Get this. More women today made their choice to what we called freeze their eggs and simply because they're finding difficulties in locating ideal partners. Well, what gives? We're living in this world and it shouldn't be so hard to find a partner for marriage or for this long-term commitment. But the reality hits. It's not working. So that's why those su successful women, they made different choices. We need to really talk about what is happening to the women in America today. And also, what does that mean when they made the choice to freeze their eggs? Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to invite our distinguished speaker, who is Professor Marsha Inhorn. Professor Marsha Inhorn is the William K. Landman Jr. Professor of Anthropology and also International Affairs. And meanwhile, as a medical anthropologist, her research interests resolve around gender and health, science and technology, feminist theories, of course, Today, we are going to talk to Professor Inhorn regarding her latest, I know I say, amazing book, which is called Motherhood on Ice, The Mating Gap and Why Women Freeze Their Eggs. Well, Professor Inhorn, and welcome to The Missing Piece. Oh, I'm so happy to be here with you tonight. Absolutely. Well, again, Professor, as we mentioned before, you know, I have to say, before having this conversation with you and I dive into your book, I have to say it's very enlightening and also it's just eye opening. Now, let's get the conversation started. I know that in your book and of course, within the expertise of your field, how should we understand those successful women today and they are finding difficulties in locating ideal partners for long-term commitment or marriage and instead they decided to freeze their eggs i know you had a genesis of study on this can you just walk us through what exactly happening today and why is this the best choice or perhaps even the ideal choice for those women in america your thoughts yeah, so uh, I, you're right, I did a very large anthropological study. It was funded by the U.S. National Science Foundation because egg freezing is a relatively new technology. Uh, it was, it's really about a decade old, about 10 years old. And when it was, uh, you know, the, the experimental label was lifted in the United States in the end of 2012, uh, my colleague at Yale, in the, he was the director of the Yale Fertility Center, said we should really try to figure out who are the women who are going to be using this new technology who will be freezing their eggs. Now, interestingly, if you looked at the media discourse and the scholarship on egg freezing, it was all about successful women who are going to be using egg freezing to plan their careers and educations mm. about career planning, that this is going to be something that women would do very intentionally to basically chart out their futures and especially to get ahead in their careers. It was a, it was an assumption that actually I think is still sort of bandied around in the media that that's why women must be freezing their eggs. Mm. So that was my main hypothesis. Oh, egg freezing is about career planning for, for women. At any rate, I started doing interviews, very in-depth interviews with women who volunteered for this study and lo and behold, it really had nothing to do with education and career planning. Mm. These were a group of already very successful, educated, professional women, most of whom had reached their 30s. I mean, the average age at egg freezing was 36, almost 37 years of age. Mm. They were well established in their careers. And one after another, the same story was, 
I'm doing it because I'm single. Mm. I haven't been able to find a partner. You know, it's mystifying to me. I, 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 I think I'm dateable. I've been trying to find a partner all along, all the way through university, but I've ended up in this situation and I can't figure it out. Why me? Mm. And then I would interview the next woman. And this book, this book is full of women's stories, mm. as you know, having looked at it. But, you know, one after another, 82% of the women in my study, at the time they froze their eggs, they were single, single, single. Mm. Some were just single. They hadn't been able to find a partner at all. And then there was a substantial percentage of women who had been in a relationship, but the relationship had ended. You know, they were in their mid to late 30s or even their early 40s. And they couldn't, uh, you know, what, what were they going to do? All of these women who freeze their eggs want what I call the three Ps. They want a partner. They want partnership, pregnancy. They want to be pregnant and they want to be parents. They want to mm. be mothers. You wouldn't use a very expensive technology like this if you didn't really have the desire to have children. And they wanted to have children using their own eggs. But they were mystified, you know, like, blaming themselves unfortunately that they must have done something wrong mm -hmm. you know why why have i ended up in this situation but then you have to look at the underlying demography um in the united states and in more than 60 percent of the world's nations like quite a few asian nations have mm -hmm. the same problem the u.s does which is that there's now a really substantial gender-based disparity in university education. Mm. Many more American women are entering into university and graduating than American men. Mm. In fact, right now, there are 27% more American women in higher education, in universities in the United States than there are men. Mm. And so one of my colleagues who wrote a great book called Datanomics really spelled it out. He said, there is a massive undersupply of university educated men in America and a massive oversupply of university educated women. In fact, in the prime reproductive years between 22 and 39, there are 3 million more women than there are men. And wow. so you've got a real problem, which I ended up calling the mating gap. You know, mm. that's the subtitle of the book. What does that mean? Women are looking for it, but they're lacking they cannot find men who are eligible, like mm. still single, mm. educated, have a university education, and uh, are equal. You know, somebody mm. sort of like them, kind of from their same educational and class background. And in the United States, there's been a lot of concern about these men who are dropping out of university education. They're underemployed. They're having trouble. There's been a lot of recent media and scholarly attention. But, you know, my book points out the, the decline of men in, you know, in terms of their education and employability does have its effects on women. Mm. And women around the world are just soaring educationally. I mean, the rates of, you know, women entering into universities around the world, it's really outstripping men in a lot of different societies. And so you, you're going to have these big disparities. And so women who want to find an educated guy, you know, who understands them, who understands why they want to work, who is going to help them in their career and, ha and having a family life, it's just going to be demographically impossible for a lot of these women. And so, you know, egg freezing came along and women who were in this situation, you know, usually by their mid thirties, they didn't have a partner. What am I going to do? Mm. This new technology was there to say like, well, at least you could freeze your eggs mm. and hope that you're going to find that mate, you know, at least the frozen eggs kind of give you a little bit of breathing room, a little bit of extra time, kind of extends your fertility a little bit. And that's really the story. It, it's not a story that's been well described because there's been so much attention to young women freezing their eggs for career planning. This had nothing to do. I mean, in a couple of cases, women were doing egg freezing in my study intentionally because, you know, they had a career plan. But this is mostly about very successful, professional, educated women who had not been able to find an equal partner like that. And it's sort of a sad story. You know, egg, egg freezing can't fix men. Mm. It can't 
fix the social problem mm. that's happening. But it, it was for women, it, it gave them a lot of relief, a lot of psychological relief. In fact, you know, n more than 90% of the women in my study had something positive to say about just the burden off their shoulders, giving them a little more time to look for a partner, you know, doing something for themselves that they could do, you know, under these circumstances. So that's the role it's playing in, in the lives of American women. And if you look at studies from other parts of the world, it's the same story, mm. lack of a partner. Mm. So yes, there are real partnership problems. I called it the men as partners problem. Mm. Professor yeah. Inkhorn, again, it's so unique. And of course, I think the better word would be surprising to hear. <laughs> I have to say that a couple years ago, we would describe this type of women who are highly educated, very successful in career. We would say, wow, any single man would desire to have someone like that. Because, you know, we're looking at the next generation or looking looking at the study of genealogy. You know, people say that would be great. But meanwhile, let me mention something that around the reality that I am looking around my friends you know, when we say women who are single and were very successful, highly educated, we we'll say, oh, because you're so picky. And that's the reason why you're single. So if you can just lower your standard a little bit more and you realize there are plenty of fish in the ocean. But again, Professor, according to your study, and according to your book, that has nothing to do with the women who are being picky. And again, help us with better understanding. Because they are so successful in career and because they're so highly educated, why aren't they appealing to men? I mean, again, education is one factor. But do you think that perhaps, perhaps it has something to do with their success that create this image that men are afraid of being close to this type of women because they are not on the same level and they do not match up in terms of the standard of attitude or standard of life. I want to hear your thoughts. Yeah, those are just excellent questions. First of all, I have to emphasize, I did not interview a single man for this large study. <laughs> the entire study was with women, and there were 150 of them. Mm. 114 of them were doing egg freezing for non-medical reasons. They were healthy women. Mm. So it's a large group of women, but I didn't interview men. So everything I had to say about men was through the eyes of women. Mm. But women did have a lot of thoughts about this. You know, for one, women question themselves, like, am I too picky? You know, mm. is that what the problem is? exactly what you're saying, you know, that there's this perception that when you reach a certain level of achievement, you know, maybe your standards are too high. But actually, you know, women really talked a great deal. They had the, these kind of, I call them their gender laments, because a, a lot of women were willing to, I'm going to say, we have these terms in anthropology, hypergamy is mating up, hypogamy mm. is mating down. Mm. There were women who were willing to date men who didn't have the same educational level mm. as they d did, or men who didn't make as much money, didn't have the same kinds of jobs. And the, the problem, they said, is that men were intimidated of them. Mm. And I had many examples, some of them funny, but kind of sad, you know, mm. of women who said, you know, for example, I live in Washington, D.C. I have a Ph.D. I work at a national science agency or something. And I go out and none of the men have my educational level. But then when they hear about where I work, they're like, oh, we can't see each other. You're smarter than I am. Mm -hmm. You know, just very straightforward, almost, I'm going to say misogynistic kinds of statements about, you know, we're not equal. I can't go out with you. They were intimidated of women and women had, you know, descriptions of like liking somebody, bring them back to their condo or whatever the man saw, the nice condo, the nice car, and then they would never see the man again, you know, so that men really, some men are intimidated of women who just have more going for them or more accomplishments. And women felt bad about that. A lot of women said, you know, I'm not an intimidating person, but they had to sort of make, you know, try to sort of make themselves less mm. accomplished. Women talked about changing their online profiles on dating apps to not mention their educational credentials and that sort of thing. And this gets into these very traditional gender norms that we have in America. I'm going to say they're all over the world, you mm. know, in every society we could say mm. is patriarchal, right? But traditionally, women have been told that they need to 
marry up mm. hypergamy somebody slightly older who's got a better career makes more money the man is supposed to be the breadwinner you know so that the woman doesn't have to work mm. that's about you know traditional notions that women should marry up and then traditionally men should engage in hypogamy or marrying down someone a bit younger fertile you know she may not have the same educational background she may you know doesn't have the same job and salary those are traditional gender norms, including in the United States. And now you've got this group of women who are so educated and accomplished. They're sort of at the top. They have no place to go up, if you will. And if they look down, you know, sometimes men are just intimidated and scared and don't want to go out with them, right? So it's a bit of a mismatch going on. You know, women just kind of, they want somebody who's equal, you know, women would say, look, I believe in gender equality. I've been trained that we should have gender equality, you know, at work and at home. And I can't find this sort of equal relationship. So that's an issue. Also in America, I'm going to say, and I think around the world, you know, the rates of marriage globally are plummeting. Mm. They're declining in a sort of historic way right and people are questioning whether they should have children i think there's concern about the earth mm. and just changing notions of family life around the world and in america you know there are people who are child free they don't intend to have children which mm. is a choice which is fine and women talked about meeting a lot of men who were just like you know single at heart they don't plan to partner they're having a good time they're having, you know, doing what they want to do in the world. They have other goals. And so women had a lot of uh, experience, especially with this category of men they called Peter Pans, mm. the men who never want to grow up mm. like Peter Pan. You know, men who might be educated and successful, but they, they, they'll they wine and dine you and mm. take you out and you think you're developing a relationship, but you find out they have no intention of settling mm. down. And so I heard a lot about the frustration of, you know, being with men who sort of you're, you're like hoping that they're going to partner with you. But when push comes to shove, they don't. And there were some really sad stories of women who went to egg freezing with the guy they were dating with somebody they might have been with for a year. They froze their eggs, hoping that the man would say, you know, yes, let's commit. Mm. And that was it. There was no intention. The man had no intention of, you know, using those eggs with the woman. So, you know, there, there were a lot of stories of just difficulties in trying to find men who were really serious and ready to partner and be parents, you know, men who wanted to marry and have kids. Mm. Those sort of traditional desires, I think, are being questioned by by women too uh, a lot of women are saying i don't want to have kids but men are definitely not like the parents generation where it was really expected that you marry and, and have children so family family making is really changing and i think the problem is that there still are a lot of women out there who do want i guess the traditional heteronormative family they want a partner and a couple of kids and those are the kind of women I was interviewing in the egg freezing study. They'd they said, I always imagined myself by age 35, I thought I'd be married with a couple of kids by now. Mm. I don't know what happened. You know, Professor, yeah. again, it sounds to me, it has a lot more to do with the issue of commitment from men and also the maturity level of men. I mean, you're right globally study that it's not just in the US and particularly with a lot of countries in Asia, the younger generations today are no longer interested in forming families, even though they are married, but children would never be on the table. This topic is completely taboo among the households. Now, I want to get back to this egg freezing uh, decision among the women. Professor Inhorn, again, I'm very much interested, and also you mentioned this before, it's not just about this decision, and also it alleviated this psychological burden among those successful, highly educated women in the US. You know, I have to say that this is not a decision. Of course, you know, again, I, I, I don't have friends, you know, around me made the decision, but after reading your book, 
this is not a decision that a person wakes up in the morning to say, oh, I'm going to uh, freeze my egg today. I believe there has to be a psychological journey. And also there has to be a lot of consultation, a lot of seeking advice, you know, those moments and struggles. In the end, probably the decision will be made. So Professor Inhor, with all the women that you interviewed and also you included in the book, how difficult was it for some of them to go through this psychological journey eventually came to the conclusion or came to the decision? Can you help us explain a little bit more? Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, so sort of the first half of my book looks at the motivations. Why are women freezing their eggs? Mm. And we've talked about that. The second half is really about the experience of it. And you're right. It is, you know, it's a difficult decision mm. to do this. And one might argue that many women wish they didn't have to freeze their eggs, right? You know, it is not an easy thing to do. Right. And I actually really want to emphasize the bravery of single women going through this because it's a bit daunting. Um, it involves, first of all, a lot of money. The United States is the most expensive place in the world to freeze your eggs, but still it's expensive all over the world. In the U.S., you know, minimally for one cycle of egg freezing, minimally, you're going to spend about 10,000 US dollars. Wow. And it's more on average about like 15,000 because you have to take hormonal medications, which are very mm. expensive, and you have to self inject them into your body. Mm. And so for the 20% of people who have needle phobia, who are scared of needles, just overcoming that hurdle of having to self inject, you know, daily hormones. You have to go in daily for monitoring of your ovaries. You know, you have there's logistical complexities to doing this. And then on the day of retrieval, where they actually remove the eggs from your body, it is a surgical intervention. It's a small, you know, you have to be anesthetized and you must have somebody accompany you. And so that was also difficult for women living in cities where maybe they didn't have family or having to ask another busy friend to accompany them on the day of retrieval. You know, I, I talk to them like, who did it? Who were your supporters? You almost need to have support. Right. And then the, the sad thing psychologically for women, it was really heartbreaking for a lot of women. Egg freezing is mostly done in IVF clinics. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's where you do the technology. IVF clinics are really set up for married couples who are infertile, who are mm -hmm. facing infertility problems. That's what IVF is all about. And so you go into these clinics as a single woman who wants to freeze her eggs and you're surrounded mm. by women with wedding rings, big diamonds, mm. their husbands. It was very lonely for single women to be doing this in the very couples oriented world of IVF. And a lot of clinics had not adjusted their practices at all for single women doing this. And so the consent forms they had to sign were all about, and will, you know, your husband has to sign too, right. or will your husband be with you on the day of the procedure or the injection classes were for you and your husband. Mm. And so women, you know, being the solo single woman, for many women, it was just very painful and heartbreaking, making them feel very alone. Like, how did I end up in this situation? Of course, I don't want to be infertile. You know, everybody's suffering in this clinic. That's right. But this is also a form of suffering. So I really ended up, I want to just sort of honor the bravery and the courage to do this thing. Mm. I actually, I said, you know, these women are badasses. Mm. Excuse me. But that is a very, you know, a, an expression we use for like, really brave people mm. and that's the way i think i really felt a lot of women had to overcome a lot of things to get to that point to do it it's just mm. not something you wake up in the morning and say ha huh, i'm going to the egg freezing clinic it's like that's a month long right major commitment of time energy money and physical physical endurance mm. and there are you know most women come through it well but, you know, it's not a pain-free procedure. You know, women, some of them did have really uncomfortable days afterward. For some, it was very easy. But anyway, and then you get eggs. This was another struggle. You need a certain amount, number of eggs to make this whole thing even workable in the mm. end. And so there's a lot of discussion about how many eggs you need to freeze. And in general, the idea is that you should try to aim for like 15 to 20 eggs to get those those eggs out of your body so that if you need to use them because some are going to be lost in the rewarming process when you actually want to use the eggs and for 
many women, it was a real struggle to get mm. that many eggs. They had to go not only through one cycle, but some went, many went through two cycles and then some who went through three, even four cycles. So you duplicate the costs of that, you know, 15 times four, you're talking about a huge financial investment. Mm. And so you can see it's really only for women who've got economic means to do it. Mm. And then that made women feel bad. That was the major recommendation of women. You know, something needs to be done about the cost of this, mm. or we need health insurance to cover this procedure because, you know, I can pay for it, but I have a sister who's a school teacher and there's no way she'll mm. ever be able to afford freezer her eggs. It's really unfair, you know, that only That's certain that. women have access to the technology. It's really, it becomes like a reproductive justice issue. Mm. If we look at reproductive justice is the right to have children, the right not to have children, and the right to parent children, you know, safely. And egg freezing allows some women the right to imagine having children, you know, mm. not that it always works, because that's another thing, it doesn't always work. Mm. For some women, they're successful, the eggs thaw, and they get good embryos. But I have stories in my book of women who got 20, 25 eggs, they tried to use them, and, and none of them ended up working. Mm. So it's not foolproof. It's not an insurance policy. Mm. It is a gamble, ultimately. It is, Professor. Well, I want to wrap up our conversation by asking you another question. Again, Dr. Inhorn, you're the professor for anthropology, and we talk about this relationship jeopardy. I mean, again, it's not just about the decision of freezing their eggs. Again, going back to what we said before, it's the difficulties in locating ideal partners. Now, I want to bring another factor into our conversation, which is social media. You know, today we're looking at this cyber relationship. Everyone, it's on their phones, you know, 24-7. And also, they have a, correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, I've been out of this game for so long, but there are still so many dating apps around the world, and I believe me, people are trying them. And I have to say, you know, only have 50-50% of shot. Either you have it or you don't. Now, Professor Inhorn, the last question I want to ask you is, how much do you think that has something to do with the cyber communication and the presence of social media that actually not bring people together, but instead are creating this what we called imaginative image of this ideal relationship, but never works in real life? I want to hear your final thoughts. Yeah, I talk to women so much about their online dating experiences, and you're absolutely right. Women said, you know, I prefer to meet somebody organically. And mm. what does that mean? That's the term for basically just meet somebody in person that mm. you can have a human conversation and meet with somebody and know if you have chemistry with them. Because so much of the world is mediated now, and so much of the meeting is mediated through these dating apps. I learned about many different dating apps that women had used, and mostly they were so discouraged. Mm. It was discouraging and discouraged. They, Women said it's kind of like a torture. It's like a second job. It's so much energy to do it, and, you know, you might meet people, but it doesn't mean it's going to work. So there was a lot of hand-wringing about the world of online dating and how difficult it was in big cities and also just about bad behavior mm. that comes with online dating, ghosting, casual ghosting, you know, just people saying they're going to meet and not meet. And I think it also gives you this imaginative world of like, oh, there are hundreds of people out there. Mm. Ah, forget this one. I'm going to move on to the next. So, yeah, I heard a lot about that. On the other hand, I also heard, heard some really you know, interesting and happy stories. And I do want to say that at the end of the book, talking about like, well, what to do, right? right? Yes, you can freeze your eggs. And that's a kind of technological extension, if you will, to help you sort of hold on to your fertility at the age that you froze your eggs, right? Mm -hmm. If you did it at age 34, you know, they're still your 34-year-old eggs if you needed to use them when you're 38. So that's, you know, it's a technological kind of extender but it doesn't really help you to find the mate that you're mm. looking for. And this is where following my colleague, John Berger, who used the term mixed collar mating, mm. because in America, we talk about white collar professionals and blue collar people in the working class. But just the idea that, you know, if there are not enough educated white collar men out there to date, you know, maybe women need to sort of expand their, their vision of who might be a good partner for them. 
And honestly, some of the happiest stories in the book are of people who met men who weren't as educated as they were, mm. but ended up being wonderful men and wonderful partners. In fact, uh, the final big story in the book was of a woman who was Ivy League educated, you know, very, very professional woman who met a firefighter on a bike trip mm. and you know they fell in love and actually 10 years on they're partnered they've got two children including a frozen egg baby and so you know a happy story about that so you know just expanding your possibilities of who you might find out mm. there i myself did that i i married i met and married a man who was much less educated at the time than i was mm. you know i knew he was intelligent and kind and he ended up being a great dad to our two children so i guess that's my recommendation for women is you know maybe go with somebody you know who wasn't the kind of person you thought you were going to be right. with it could actually be a wonderful life that's right. Well, again, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to speak to Professor Marsha Inhorn. Again, Professor Marsha Inhorn is the William K. Lentman Jr. Professor of Anthropology and also International Affairs. Again, as a medical anthropologist, her research include around gender, health, science, and technology. And I strongly encourage everyone to go online, look for her amazing book, which is entitled Motherhood on Ice, the mating gap and why women freeze their eggs. Well, Professor, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure speaking to you and I really appreciate your insights and analysis. And we'd love to have you on the show as we continue to pay attention, not just about this issue, but around all the issues involved in science and technology, gender and equality around the world. So thank you so much for doing this. Oh, thank you. It's been delightful speaking with you. Thank you so much for having me on your show.